in the next minute or so. For those of you that don't know who I am, my name is Sean Cottrell. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Law in Sport. Delighted to welcome you to today's webinar in collaboration and partnership with our good friends at the Asser Institute and the Association for Study of Sport and EU, and that's Sport and EU. And just uh, as a plug, if you haven't signed up to their news alerts, their Twitter accounts, etc., you absolutely should, um, particularly over the next few days. There'll be a lot to, to follow on there. So I thoroughly recommend you do that. It's been very good to, to observe today already. As I said, if you want to introduce yourself in the chat feature, please do so. But if you have questions um, that you would like to ask, please use the Q&A feature. You can raise your hand as well, and we'll try to come to you where we can. However, as you would imagine, there's going to be a lot of ground to cover. So the proceedings will work that we will ask the, each of our experts who uh, we like to thank for giving up their time um, for their preparations for today and for, the, for giving up their time right now uh, to share their thoughts with you. Um, we'll give them an opportunity to give their reflections and their thoughts, and then we'll come to questions um, afterwards. So other than that, um, so we can get, there's a lot of ground that I said to cover. I'm going to hand over to Anton, who's going to provide um, a short summary of the ISU and Super League cases. And then I'll hand over to Vanya, who will do the same for the Antwerp case. And then we'll do a round robin uh, with our other speakers. So Anton, over to you. Thank you, Shane. Thank you uh, to all the participants that are still coming in. Uh, I think I've personally never spoken uh, online or almost offline as a speaker to such a, to such a big audience. So it's a, it's a privilege to be here. I must also use a disclaimer. I haven't eaten since uh, this morning, eight o'clock, and I've been reading uh, approximately 250 pages of decisions uh, before uh, this webinar, so if I'm not totally entirely coherent, I hope you will uh, you will pardon me. Um, and let me start with a second disclaimer, um, as I will um, start by introducing the, the ICU case. Uh, as some of you may know on the call, um, we, with my uh, dear colleague Ben van Rompuy, former colleague I should say, uh, were at the origins of this case in, in 2014. Um, it was uh, prepared in, in our office in, at the Arsene Institute and, and uh, lodged and followed um, by us as long as it was before uh, the European Commission. So this case, and I think this case is also intimately linked to the fact that we are discussing the Super League case today. Uh, we cannot understand the emergence of the Super League and the Super League case without, under, without having in the back the decision of the European Commission that came in 2017 in the ICU case. This case concerned uh, an alternative event that was supposed to be organized in Dubai uh, by a company called Ice Derby, and which basically, in short, the ICU uh, prevented to happen by threatening anybody that would participate in those competitions uh, with a certain amount of sanctions under their eligibility rules. And this is um, then um, the complaint, a complaint was filed at the commission and the commission sided with the two complainants, which were two high level speed skaters of the, from the Netherlands. Um, and um, in 2017, the complaint, uh, the decision was appealed uh, before the general court, which also rendered its uh, first instance judgment in 2020, siding mostly with the commission, but finding, and this is important in the discussion, that the part of the decision of the commission related to the court of arbitration for sports was to be invalidated. Um, and here we come to our decision today, which uh, basically endorses uh, the position of the uh, European Commission by recognizing that uh, there was a um, restriction of competition by object that was uh, caused by the eligibility rules of ICU, but as well, it announced the decision of the general court on the part dedicated to the Court of Arbitration for Sports. And this is significant, significant and I hope this is something that um, will be addressed as well by uh, some of our speakers, or if not, I'll take the liberty to talk about it later in greater detail. Um, I think 
mainly the ICU decision, uh, the appeal was focused on whether this was a restriction by object or by effect, um, or, or should have been framed as a restriction by effect. Uh, the court basically uh, hammered in paragraph 145 and 146 the main reasons why uh, these type of eligibility rules should be considered a restriction by object. But a restriction by object that can be in a way justified if uh, this restriction, this power of authorizations, and the sanctions that come with eligibility rules are exercised without discrimination, are transparent and objective, these type of governance criteria. And this is important that uh, we remember because the headlines are going to say uh, all, all across the board, the sports governing body is lost today, but they lost only in part. They lost because their governance, the quality of their governance in both cases was insufficient, not because they imposed restrictions. So this is important to, I think, keep in mind. And then let me turn to the Super League. I think I don't need to introduce that much the case, I hope, or I think. <laughs> Uh, I think most of you will be familiar with the uh, with the factual background. Um, there are three aspects that uh, I hope we will get to discuss today. The first one in the decision, I mean, the first one is re is uh, regarding Article One Six Five and its impact uh, on EU law in general when applied to sport. It seems, and I I'm sorry for Advocate General Rentos but that uh, his interpretation of Article 165 was brutally rejected by the court um, in uh, paragraph 100 to 106. Uh, it's pretty clear that the court, and the court then does not mention Article 165 after that. Uh, please note that in the judgment, neither in the judgment in ISU nor in Tupani. So uh, Article 165 even probably um, got uh, further back than it was, let's say, in uh, the case of Olivier Bernard. Um, so here, this is, this is one first remarkable point. The second point, um, it is the alignment, almost total alignment uh, of uh, the interpretation under, uh, of Article 101, restriction by object, and Article 102, and on the criteria already proposed in ICU, meaning that an authorization uh, regulation and eligibility rules of sports governing bodies will be considered restrictions by object, which again doesn't mean that if they have certain qualities, they cannot be justified. And here, it is important to note that the court in, art, in paragraph 144 recognized that there is a legitimacy in uh, imposing conditions that are related to the calendar and that are related to merit and equality of opportunity. Though this paragraph will stand and will be used in the future to uh, regulate the possibility of alternative competitions uh, to emerge. Um, and the final point, which uh, I think was uh, more unexpected or less visible, uh, until now was a question on, of the economic rights that are attached to the UEFA and FIFA's competitions. And the fact that the rules that confer to UEFA and FIFA exclusive uh, power over those rights are also deemed to be restrictive of one uh, by object of, one, of Article 101 and an abuse of dominance position uh, under Article 102. But and this is also, I think, the most important part of the judgment, paragraph 233, 235. Um, there are efficiency defenses that are deemed credible by the court uh, re regarding the fact that they reduce transaction costs, but also, and I think primarily, the fact that they allow an equitable share of the revenue to be redistributed to all consumers, fans, citizens, through the solidarity contributions. And this means now that the national courts will have to engage very uh, thoroughly in terms of the accounting dimension of where the money of sports governing bodies is actually going. This is not necessarily a decision that rejects 
that exclusive monopoly over the rights of the competition, but it is a decision that forces, I think, uh, sports governing bodies to account in accounting term for where that money is going. Uh, voilà, I hope uh, that was relatively clear. Uh, if not, I, I did work on a few Twitter threads that might be uh, also uh, useful, and I hand over to Vanya. Thank you, thank you, Antoine. Um, since this case is not very, very, it was not so in focus like it was the both cases you mentioned. I prepare a short, a short presentation about the Royal Antwerp case, or let's call it the home ground player rules. Um, for for our, our guests today and our participants, um, it's important to know that it's a rule that was drafted quite far away along from today in 2005 uh, what was the scope of the rule as you can see it was to fight less competitive balance in UEFA club competitions um, also uh, and, and of course and some domestic rules an increased link between money and sporting success and a few opportunities for local trained players to play it was it was uh, the idea was to implement it gradually in the UEFA club competitions from 2006 with four homegrown players rules until uh, 2008 and uh, nine season with eight homegrown players rules that uh, are still in force as in in today's rules. Um, uh, no club may have more than 25 players on the list A during the season, and in that list, and that is the list which is in focus. Um, uh, eight places are reserved for, for let's call it home ground player rules or locally trained players, uh, which means that uh, no club may have also more than four associated trained players on this list of eight players. If a club has fewer than eight locally trained players in its squad, then the maximum number of players on the list A is reduced accordingly. Uh, so who is a club? A club trained players. You can see here that uh, the focus on the players who between the age of 15 and 21 um, are his respective of, of her or his nationality and age has been registered with his current club for a period continuous or not and that is also important to, to mention of three entire seasons or of 36, 36 months. An association club player is a player who fulfill all the conditions of a club trained players but has been registered with the club or with other clubs affiliated to the same association of his current current club at, at the moment. Here you can see the, the list from the UEFA Champions League uh, last season uh, uh, regulations and rules. It's the same for, for this year. And you can see the list of 25, uh, the, the so-called free places and the number of locally trained players or club trained players and uh, what is the, the number of players that the club can have on the list on the list A. Uh, and submitted for all three UEFA clubs competitions. Uh, but what is important to mention here that this case, in this case, the the counterparty was not UEFA, was the uh, the was it the uh, Belgium uh, Federation, uh, and the rule that the Belgium Federation has been applied. Um, the, the the rule of the Belgium Federation is very similar to the UEFA one, but not completely similar. You can see that they focus. Uh, on both uh, competitions uh, in Belgium, uh, and the list must include at least eight trained uh, players by Belgium clubs. At least three of those eight players must have been affiliated to a Belgium club for at least three seasons before the 21st birthday, and uh, at least six players who have been affiliated for at least three full seasons before the 23rd birthday, two of which before 21st birthday. Um, like uh, Antoine previously said, uh, the, 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 the history of the case firstly started with arbitration procedure in Belgium when the player brought an action before the uh, Belgium Court of Arbitration for Sport, seeking a declaration that the rules actually in, uh, infringe Article 45 and 101 of the treaty. Then the Royal Antwerp case and that is actually the name of the case uh, or before the Court of Justice, uh, voluntary intervene in the proceedings. UEFA was not party of that case. <clears throat> and in the award, the, the Belgium uh, Court of Arbitration for Sport uh, said that those rules uh, were inadmissible, that the claim was inadmissible um, insofar as they relate to the home ground prayer rules, uh, rules put in place by UEFA, and admissible but unfounded for the Belgium Belgian federations. Um, the court said 
that it did not infringe the free movement of workers guaranteed by Article 45 and did not give rise to any discrimination or in any event justify legitimate objectives and were not disproportionate to them. There was no breach also of Article 101 of the treaty according to the Belgium Ar uh, Court of Arbitration for, for sport. Then um, uh, the, the parties went to the, to the Court of First Instance in, in Belgium, uh, to the Brussels Court of First Instance, uh, and they asked for the annulment of the arbitration award based, of course, uh, uh, on the award being contrary to public policy. And uh, they asked the legal procedure to argue uh, in substance that UEFA and the Belgium rules infringe the freedom of movement for workers in the EU. And it's important to mention that this was something that was asked by the parties. And then the, uh, the, the Belgium court uh, lodged a preliminary ruling with the following questions, as you can see. Uh, I will now not focus on the questions because later on I will just uh, uh, say what the court uh, decided today. Um, we also must stress that we had the Advocat General uh, Spooner's opinion delivered on the 9th of March 2023 of this year. And uh, here we must stress that uh, in the uh, in the opinion, the Advocat General highlighted that he was requested by the court uh, to have its decision uh, and opinion about uh, the free movement of workers aspect in the case, uh, not according and not to say anything about the EU competition law rules. Although, of course, the court today mentioned uh, firstly the competition law rules and then moved to the free movement rules. Uh, and of course, the Advocat General, as you can see here, uh, you probably know that, uh, said that the Article 45 must be interpreted as precluding the application of those rules uh, by uh, issued by the UEFA and the Belgium Federation. Um, then uh, today, uh, we had this third uh, decision. Uh, maybe some of you didn't have time because most people were focused on the Super League and the ICU case, but it is very interesting to know that um, the court said that we can say the homegrown players rules, of course, fall within the scope of Article 45 and 101. Um, they must be regarded as having a direct impact on that work, uh, uh, making me meaning uh, working conditions, uh, and that they impose certain certain conditions on, on that. Um, uh, furthermore, we may say that the court said that uh, uh, it appears that those rules limit by the very nature of the possibility for the clubs to include on the sheet players who do not meet those requirements. And we, we completely understand that. Uh, here we must stress that uh, what's interesting on the third play that, that the court said regarding the outcome, uh, which the rules at issue in the main proceeding seeks to attain, they appear to limit or control one of the essential parameters of competition, namely the recruitment of talented players. Whatever the club or place where they were trained, which could enable their team to win in the encounter with the opposing team. That limitation is likely to have an impact on the competition, according to the court. Notwithstanding that, it's free for the referring court to determine, and that is important to stress that the court actually uh, said that it's to the Belgium court to, in the end, decide whether the rules at issue in the main proceedings reveal, by the very nature, a sufficient degree of harm to competition to be able to be regarded as having as their object of the restriction of competition. If that is not the case, then they should determine whether those rules can be regarded as having as their actual or potential effect the restriction of competition on the market concern. Uh, and then, okay, here uh, we may say that the court uh, dealing with the competition uh, issues uh, recalls the ethical and professional conduct rules. And that is important to stress, especially when we, uh, when we speak about the competition rules, I also mentioned the anti-doping rules, for example. But here, what is very important to stress that the court recalls that the conduct under consideration must allow uh, with a sufficient degree of pro uh, probability the achievement of efficient gains. And that is very, very important. By reserving for users an equitable part of the profit resulting from those gains without imposing restrictions that are not indispensable for achieving those gains and without eliminating all effective competitions for a substantial part of the products or services. Pre previously, Antoine mentioned uh, important cases like, for example, the Bernard case. Uh, and then uh, speaking about the uh, free movement, uh, free movement uh, part, Prima Facie 
The court said it infringed the free movement of movement for workers, those rules. And it said that they are likely to give rise to indir indirect discrimination. That is extremely important to, to stress. Then, of course, we know that that measures of non-state origin, and these are the rules in case of the Belgian Federation, may be permitted even though they impede the freedom of movement and trained in the treaty in two cumulative conditions, which you can see here and you know very well, that those measures must pursue a legitimate objective in the public interest, and those measures must observe the principle of proportionality, which entails that they are suitable for ensuring the achievement of that objective and do not go beyond what is necessary for those perspect. Uh, and then the court in the end said that the objective of encouraging recruitment and training of young professional football players constitutes such a legitimate objective in the public interest. Again, very similar to what we previously said uh, and heard in some cases. And then by placing on the same level, all young players who have been trained by any club affiliated to the national FA in question, those rules might not constitute real and significant incentives for some of those clubs, and in particular, those with significant financial resources. However, it is precisely local investment in the training of young players, in particular, when it's carried out by small clubs were appropriate in partnership with other clubs in the same region and possibly with some cross-border dimension, which contribute to the fulfillment of the social and educational functions. Uh, saying that here, I will close and I will pass the floor to Sean, uh, which will, uh, when Sean will continue with the future future movement of, the, of this meeting. Thank you, Sean. Well, thank you. Um, and thank you, um, Antoine, for, the, for that brilliant overview. Um, you know, distilling quite complex cases into nice, short, bite-sized chunks. So thank you very much. Um, just for those that join late, I keep reiterating this. If you have questions, please put them in the Q&A feature. We'll take them there. I'm now going to hand over to Benoit. Benoit, over to you. Uh, good afternoon. And first of all, thank you all very much for inviting me to participate in this uh, distinguished event. And uh, it's a pleasure to meet you directly uh, that I can see and also the many people who are watching online. Um, my first reaction, well, I think today's ruling safeguards the beautiful game. And let me explain why. First of all, this judgment and UEFA and FIFA in this case, they weren't there alone. They were there as part of a team. La Liga, RFEF were there standing alongside them. But in addition, they had statements of support from the fans, the leagues, the clubs, the players, from a multiple set of organizations. There was also 23 member states. That's an unprecedented number in any European case I have ever seen that came in and intervened and stressed the importance of, um, of this issue for the Court of Justice. And what united the football community and the member states is a sense that football is more than just entertainment. It is a way of life. And I think this is reflected in the judgment with respect to Antoine, I, the court does actually recognise that sport has undeniably specific characteristics. And with respect to football, it also recognises the considerable social and cultural importance of football in the European Union. So I think this is a very important message that the court has sent us. And then in good football punditry terms, I'm going to tell you, Sean, that uh, we don't need to consult VAR. We don't even need to go back, uh, do action replays. The result is absolutely emphatic, in my view. First, the European Court of Justice has recognised the right of UEFA to be the regulator for European football, and in addition, to continue to organise its club competitions, in particular the Champions League, Europa League, and, and, and the other major tournaments that it organises. Secondly, the European Court of Justice has confirmed the right of UEFA to require organisers of international club competitions to apply for authorisation through pre-authorisation procedures. And it's only when there isn't a set of rules and regulations in place that competition problems arise. But if you have in place a transparent, non-discriminatory procedure, then you are compatible with European law. There is no infringement of, uh, of competition. And thirdly, and this is absolutely important to understand, the ECJ, the European Court of Justice, has recognised for the first time that the principle of sporting merit and the equality of opportunities for clubs can be taken into account 
when looking at authorising an international club competition. And in particular, at 193, it says, for example, that the values and rules of the games underpinning professional football, in particular, the open meritocratic nature of the competition concerns may well constitute legitimate um, legitimate objectives being pursued by the federations. Now, I think you would have to be, I, I've obviously <laughs> had a busy day reading through these judgments, but even I've picked up uh, the odd message from on the internet of, of the reaction from um, uh, the, the Super League. And I, I must say, I, I, I'm rather mystified that they, they have claimed some sort of success because uh, by fact of the fact, by, as a result of the criticisms of, of UEFA's rules that there were in the time, but look, you know, those authorization rules and procedures um, uh, were in place uh, at the time of the judgment. And the case was referred in a way that maybe didn't necessarily give the Court of Justice full understanding of, of how they operated. Uh, but we shouldn't forget that the authorization issue was actually a live one. Um, it wasn't that uh, nothing was being done, but we did have a pandemic to deal with. UEFA fought for the survival of football over the year of the pandemic. But then in 2020, work started on codifying um, uh, the authorization procedures. And uh, some serious work was being done on that when actually the Super League um, crisis unfolded. And the irony was, is that the people who were behind the Super League were in the prime positions at the time. Had they given any interest whatsoever to the authorization rules and procedures of UEFA, they were sitting at the table. This wasn't like in the ISU where it's a lone independent organizer who wasn't necessarily familiar with the ISU and not a member of it. They were sitting at the table and they had an opportunity, had they wished to, to really go into the details of the authorization rules. But unsurprisingly, they didn't. In any event, UEFA finished that codification process and adopted a new set of regulations that, in my view, completely are completely consistent with the, uh, the requirements of having a detailed and uh, non-discriminatory set of rules in place. Because let's be clear what was this case was about. This was an attempt by the Super League not to tinker with UEFA's authorization rules, but to destroy the European sports model. And that's why the case was filed on the same day that they launched. And in that, I think reading the judgment, they have failed utterly. And that's why, although some people might be a bit surprised by it, I am actually uh, find a lot of uh, very, very positive messages coming out of this judgment. And I think football and sport, of course, are going to have challenges in the years ahead. But today, I think we can be proud that this generation of Europeans stood up and protected the European sports model when it counted. And we can now proceed in the future of European football in a bright light. So I'm looking forward to the questions from the panel and from <laughs> the audience. Thank you. Thanks, Benoit. Um, so we've got a bunch of questions that have come in already. And forgive me for those people who are asking the questions, just because we've got so many experts on, we're going to try to give everyone an opportunity to contribute first, then we're going to come to the questions, but I'm taking note of them. So thank you very much for that. Um, there's also, there has been one question about, will this be shared? Yes, the video for this will be on our YouTube channel. I think on the Astor Institute and Sport in EU as well, we'll distribute it and we'll put it onto our podcast as well. So it'd be freely distributed and available for everyone. Um, Miguel, would you like to give your view now? Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation and for the opportunity and also for discussing with some good friends and people, uh, some of which I agree, others I disagree <laughs> on these issues, but we'll be happy to, to discuss and engage. Let me start by what I think is the first, the overall message that results from the three judgments of the court. I think the overall message is that the court of justice um, clearly recognizes the importance for sports of the pyramidal structure of organization of sports, having at the top uh, sports organizations and sports association. The courts recognizes the importance of that model and that there are objectives that the court attaches to that model uh, that justify even a different interpretation of new rules or exceptions to new rules. At the same time, and therefore, as a consequence of that, that these sports associations can be entrusted regulatory and licensing powers over the economic markets that are linked to these sports domains. 
At the same time, the three judgments make clear that the court assesses in a very negative manner the way these organizations are structured and the way they currently exercise these regulatory and licensing powers. So if on the one hand, the court says, yes, we accept the specificity of the sports model with the with pyramid structures, the specific objectives it pursues, and the need even to have sports organizations at their top. On the other one, the way they are structured themselves, and both the framework under which their power is exercised, to use an expression that the court employs in the judgments. It's not conducive to those objectives, and actually it's conducive to arbitrary, discriminatory, non-transparent, not subject to independent control decisions. And, and, and I think that this is actually the, the, the core message of the three judgments, and it's important that all take this fully into account. Um, if I think that this means that the Super League is far from having reasons to celebrate, I'm also concerned with the initial reaction of UEFA, that from my point of view appears again, as has been typical of sports organizations, to underestimate the extent of the reforms that they have to undertake in order to comply with the requirements that are in the judgment. To say, oh, we've adopted some standard rules now, everything is fine, you can play with. It's completely underestimating what the court is trying to convey in these judgments. And by the way, I think that if the Super League is in the media portrayed at this moment as having won, is, I have to say, responsibility of UEFA. Because UEFA tried to transform this case in order to maximize the chances of winning as a case that was a case about the Super League. And I, I remember, uh, for example, in, even in a panel with, uh, with Borja and, and, and Juan, that I always said, no, this is not a case about whether or not the Super League should be accepted. This is a case about the powers of UEFA. But the UEFA itself tried in the entire hearing to make this a case about the, uh, the, the Super League. And, and therefore, since to a large extent they've lost uh, the, the, uh, the case, uh, it seems that the loss that they have with respect to the case uh, is interpreted as meaning that the Super League won. When the Super League has not won, and the court is absolutely clear about that. The court states very clearly, yeah. this is not a case about the Super League. We're not deciding even on the uh, uh, whether the Super League should be uh, accepted. We're not deciding whether the Super League itself is compatible with EU law. We are deciding only on the extent of how UEFA, of the UEFA powers, and the, how UEFA has been exercising these powers. And here the court is clear in, in considering that the way that the UEFA has been exercising its powers is un, 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 unlawful. Uh, and, and I'll try to be brief uh, in other uh, why I think the court is doing that, saying first that the court is also clear on an important aspect that had been raised by the Advocate General opinion. The court doesn't share the Advocate General interpretation of Article 165. Uh, uh, and is clear about it, um, radically uh, diverges from the Advocate ge General, uh, to put it more mildly than, than Antoine. <laughs> uh, um, and by the way, another thing where the court clearly diverges from the Advocate General is by making clear that, and this is important in light of the statement of President Seferi this, uh, at lunchtime, by making it clear that the fact that the uh, an organization a competition can be created that clubs can go are free to go and create an alternative competi competition uh, is not a viable alternative if the clubs will be sanctioned uh, by uh, of not participating in the national competitions or in the UEFA competition so the advocate general had raised that argument that argument is again picked up was again picked up and over lunch time by president Seferi. you know they can always go on and create their own competition but they they are outside they they have to be either in or outside. The court clearly says this is not acceptable in a way of dealing with, with this, by the way. Uh, uh, now, I think the court make, basically does two things that challenges the current way that UEFA needs to do. The first one is the way it develops the criteria for uh, um, rules that need to be non-discriminatory, transparent, objective, subject to independent review, because it develops it further with respect uh, uh, and providing it with more teeth than it had in previous decisions, in my view, 
It's more demanding. And linking that to a conception of an entire framework that guarantees that the power is not going to be used in an arbitrary manner and in a manner that is destined to favor UEFA's own competition. The court is clear about that. So this criteria is not, can, is not enough to pay lip service to this criteria. We, they need to be set in a way that makes sure that the UEFA is not going, UEFA or any other sports organization are not going to use it to their own benefit. In addition, the court makes clear it's talking both of substantive rules and procedural rules. Uh, and it's important to develop and think what this will mean in terms of the, of the concept. What are the procedurals that guarantee that framework that the court is requiring? In addition, there's a second aspect of the case where I think uh, it's problematic and will require deeper changes on the part of UEFA and the re deeper rethinking is that the court makes clear that uh, uh, um, UEFA's own competitions uh, um, are accepted only in so far as UEFA will be able to demonstrate that they are actually better in pursuing the objectives of merit, equal opportunity of competition, openness with distribution, than alternative competitive models that could be presented. So the court clearly opens the door for other organizations that not the Super League, any other, to come up with alternative models. And, and if they demonstrate that these models are actually better at redistributing the income of the competition, are actually better in terms of sporting meta, are actually better in terms of openness and balance of the, of the competitions, then UEFA could not make its own competitions prevail simply because they are no competition, has to accept these alternative method, models. And this is so because the court makes clear that this is something that the national courts will have to review, particularly in the, in the, in the, in paragraphs under the 95 and the following ones, the court is very clear on that kind of assessment that ultimately national courts will have to assess if it's better for consumers to maintain no effort competitions or alternative competitions that are being put forward. From my point of view, this is good for consumers. And, and if UEFA only really wants to pursue those objectives, they should be happy with it. One final point. This means that a lot will ultimately be in the hands of national courts. There will be a risk there of divergent the, the, the decisions uh. because it depends on where these companies coming up with new competitive models will be set up and bringing their cases. Uh, uh, there is a risk. And in my view, this is also an opportunity for the EU political process, as I've argued, and Steve, for example, I've also argued, to actually consider the risks of the fragmentation of national judicial decisions in this respect and of leaving to national courts the implementation of this and perhaps the need for EU legislation to provide that framework that I think is very necessary in this area. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, lots of lots of things to consider in that thus far. And again, thanks, everyone. I know it um, can be frustrating when you've asked your question, you're sitting there waiting. But I think as as the last presentations have, have already proven, there's a lot of ground to cover and lots of great points being made by our speakers that I think will be fleshed out more as we go. I'm now going to hand over to Stephen. Stephen, can we get your views, please? Yeah, thanks very much. Um so the three judgments demand a much higher level of scrutiny under EU law of practices of governing bodies than Advocate General Rantos did last December. So there's a change of tone. Legally, that change in tone is most obvious, first of all, in the treatment of Article 165, which is much more restrained today than Rantos's claim that it constitutionalized the European sports model. And secondly, the change of tone is seen in the court's concern to emphasize that Vouters, maker Medina, applies only exceptionally to defend governing bodies' regulatory roles, and not at all where conduct has its object, the prevention, restriction, or distortion of competition. But do the judgments deny that sport may have special features which affect legal interpretation? No. Do the judgments offer the last word on what those special features are? No. Let me turn to the particular case of governing bodies as gatekeepers. That's to say, 
governing bodies claiming a power to authorize new events or not, the power to determine the conditions under which potentially competing undertakings may enter the market. Well, the court today tells us that EU law is violated where that power is not governed by transparent, clear and precise substantive criteria, which make it possible to prevent it from being used arbitrarily. Those criteria must be appropriate to ensure the non-discriminatory exercise of such a power and to enable effective review. And there's important observations on review by arbitration in the skating union case. Moreover, there shall be transparent and non-discriminatory procedural rules. That's Article 102. That's Article 101. That's Article 56. So it's competition and free movement law. This is general EU internal market law. And the court takes care to point out this is consistent with existing internal market case law in a wide range of economic sectors far beyond sport. So we can understand these requirements as EU law insisting on good governance standards, transparency, non-discrimination and so on, as a precondition to finding regulatory practices to be lawful. So, so let's turn it around. Let, let's assume that a governing body has such a gatekeeping power governed by transparent, clear and precise substantive criteria which make it possible, possible to prevent the power from being used arbitrarily. Let's assume they're appropriate to ensure the non-discriminatory exercise of the power and to enable effective review. Let's assume the procedures are transparent and non-discriminatory. Is that enough? Does EU law have anything more to say? Well, yeah, the court does take us a bit further, but there's a lot more that we need to know about in this story. I've got two questions, which I'll try and answer on the basis of most of all the Super League ruling. My first question, could a governing body, uh, well, could UEFA, could UEFA refuse to authorise a closed league? And could it penalise participants? Obviously not when it has the inadequate framework, which is the background to today's ruling. But let's assume UEFA's cleaned up its act Let's assume UEFA now has processes which meet the court's requirements. Could it refuse to authorise a closed league? I think yes. Paragraph 143 tell us that participation in and conduct of competitions is based on sporting merit, which can only be guaranteed if all the teams involved compete under homogenous regulatory and technical conditions ensuring a certain equality of opportunity. Paragraph 144 tells us it's legitimate to make the organization and conduct of international football competitions subject to common rules, and more broadly to promote competitions based on equal opportunities and merit. Court says compliance can legitimately be ensured by prior authorization. Paragraph 176, dealing with Article 101, states that rules on prior authorization may be motivated by the pursuit of certain legitimate objectives, such as that of ensuring respect for the principles, values and rules of the game which underpin professional football. And paragraph 253 has that same phrase in application to the free movement provisions. So yeah, it, it seems to me that on the basis of today's ruling, it's potentially lawful for UEFA to act to suppress a competition not based on access via sporting merit, subject to UEFA showing it uses transparent, objective, non-discriminatory criteria. And that means too, that UEFA's own competitions need to have their access based on sporting merit. Second question. Could UEFA refuse to authorise a second Champions League and penalise participants? That's to say, let's imagine that's what, what is proposed by a third party organiser is something that is identical to what UEFA does, except only it shall not be owned by UEFA. It shall be owned by the third party organiser. Could UEFA refuse to authorise a second Champions League? I think 
No. This seems to me to be the consequence of paragraph 151 on non-discrimination. This tells us that UEFA itself is economically active in the market in which it has the power of pre-authorization. So the criteria applicable must not favor UEFA over third parties. If UEFA puts on a particular competition, it seems to me that the judgment is telling us that it may not stop a third party putting on an identical competition and competing with UEFA. I've often wondered whether UEFA could claim a need to have one and only one European competition for the elite clubs to produce the true champion so that European football isn't like boxing. Well, there's no hint of that in today's judgment, which seems to be opening the door to competing competitions and competing champions. In events staged by different operators, not just UEFA. And, and paragraph 176 of the Super League judgment is, seems even stronger. It notes that the pre-authorization rules limit the design and marketing of alternative or new competitions even though they might offer an innovative format attractive to consumers. Well, that's suggesting an even tighter control over UEFA than merely a non-discrimination standard. It's suggesting, as Miguel has already developed, that what's at stake here is a comparison between the quality of the competitions that might be on offer. That's explosive. That seems to me to be the most dynamic part of the ruling. Again, in line with Miguel, a lot here is being left to the referring courts to make investigations and relatively unusually the court's judgment keeps pressing the need for empirical investigation, factual inquiry to be conducted at national level. That may well throw up some divergent, unpredictable consequences. That may well result in a push, perhaps from UEFA itself, to a more political input to provide a more predictable framework for European football into the future. That as Miguel and I have written increasingly over the past few years, would seem to me to be a very beneficial outcome of this, the shift from litigation to legislation. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, Stephen, very much for that. I've got lots of questions that I've written down, but we'll, we'll save those for later. Uh, uh, Rissa, over to you. Thank you, Sean. Um, so, yeah, it was a um, very important day today for all of us. Um, and um, to me, the judgments uh, represent just a further development of the existing case law, even if it's this development is of extremely high quality, in my opinion. Um, it's probably not that revolutionary as it is uh, represented in presented in the headlines of today's media. But uh, for sports lawyer, I think it's a huge um, chunk of material to work uh, on, and especially for the sports governing bodies to uh, plan their um policy making in the upcoming uh, years. So um, again, to me, um, the court goes rather further than I expected, um, because uh, to me, it's a quite a straightforward um, uh, judgment. Um, and um, uh, well, my research uh, originally was based on the ISU case, so I would refer more often to this case. But I really like the interaction between the uh, Super League and ICU cases, even um, because ICU has a more human face, both literally and uh, figuratively. And originally, I was quite afraid of it being tarnished by the campaign launched by the Super League. Um, but I think that the court managed to um, uh, to uh, answer the uh, questions of two respected, respective cases quite nicely. Um, so, um, uh, to me also, what is uh, important in the case is that, um, the court is quite uh, sober about what sport it is, is today, uh, that it is an industry. Yes, uh, true. Like Benoit has said, um, uh, the uh, social, uh, role of sport is being, um, recognized one more time, but, um, it is also quite a dynamic judgment because, um, the court also recognized that uh, sport is a huge, huge industry and uh, should be treated as such. And uh, it is uh, seen, for example, when uh, examining the um, justifications of the UEFA, uh, uh, the court pays more attention 
to the those justifications that make the sport function as an industry, like the effective, like undistorted calendar or the equality of opportunity, rather than just to say social importance, no matter how important it is, it's still um, something that like pushes um, um, sport and makes it work for all of us. Um, so um, the uh, sport is also aware of that like sport is um, a business uh, in both professional and amateur sectors. Um, and uh, that um, uh, even individual athletes are big undertakings today. Um, uh, in more legal terms, um, yeah, it, it, these judgments develop the existing case law. Um, if we uh, should um, summarize uh, the judgments, I would um, uh, choose the word good governance to uh, use as a keyword um, because um, uh, the rule of thumb, um, as was uh, first mentioned in the Moto case in 2008, um, uh, these uh, standards of transparency, uh, of um, objectivity, non-discrimination, and uh, most importantly to me, um, of um, judicial review. That is why um, Antoine shouldn't be afraid of this uh, uh, cast arbitration part of the ICU um, judgment uh, being ignored, because it's really very, very interesting how, um, cast, like, we, uh, uh, this question is not buried at all, um, even after the um, uh, Mutu-Pechstein uh, judgment uh, in 2018. Um, the European Court of Justice uh, still recognizes the uh, multiple flaws of cost arbitration, in, especially in conjunction with the EU law. Um, and um, it, it's interesting uh, which uh, repercussions it would have on cost arbitration uh, in the upcoming uh, months. Um, but um, uh, we we should all be aware that uh, this uh, question is far from being closed. Um, otherwise, um, in terms of um, sports governance, I think um, the important uh, takeaway is that uh, the whole system is still there. Nothing, nothing bad happened. Uh, we all uh, um, keep going. Um, even the gatekeeping function is preserved but um, in only within the framework of uh, high standards of good governance. So all these sports governing bodies probably should uh, um, <clears throat> focus mainly on this, um, this particular segment. And it concerns both the uh, substantial rules, procedural rules, uh, sanctions, and uh, the question of um, subsequent CAS reforms. This is probably the most difficult and delicate part. Um, uh, otherwise, uh, um, th there are no indications of a court willing uh, to have uh, some very drastic uh, structural uh, uh, reforms such as division of commercial and uh, regulatory, like um, <clears throat> um, following the example of Formula One. So um, otherwise, um, we probably, uh, would see a, a beautiful um, uh, collaboration also with the um, other uh, sports uh, stakeholders, because I think it is uh, also not not only the question of good governance but of wise wise governance and uh, politically it can push sports governing bodies to search for um, more original um, solutions in their policy making. So that's Thanks. that's my take off. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Rusa. I'm now going to hand over to Victoria and then we'll go to once um, Victoria, we've heard from Victoria. Um, we will then start to work our way through the Q&A session and also hear any other comments from the speakers on, on what other speakers have said. So, Victoria, over to you. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, so I will use my eight minute allocation to briefly touch upon the interplay between competition law and sport and then concentrate on the practical implications of these cases and what they mean for the wider sports world. So on interplay between competition and sport first, I think the message from the court uh, sent today was very clear. It was very much, 
Dear sport governing bodies, remember that you are a company engaged in economic activity and therefore subject to the same laws as every other commercial body, meaning competition law. The application of competition law to the sports sector is not new. As Rusa said, it's rather an old concept. There's many cases that preceded, but it is an interesting one because of the function of sports governing bodies, um, which can be broken up into two categories. The first one being the pure governance function. So effectively being the regulator of the sport. And then secondly, the commercial function, so organizing competition, exploiting media rights, etc. And it's as a result of the second, the second function, not necessarily secondary in importance, possibly quite the contrary, because we're talking money. Um, but it's as a result of this commercial function that we're really talking about competition law and competition law applies because as most of us know, competition law only applies to bodies that are engaged in economic activity. But there is a perceived tension between the two, and I, I'll explain why I say perceived in a moment. Um, so perceived tension between the governance uh, functions, so the pursuit of certain objectives, and the rules applicable as a result of the commercial function, so the application of competition law. So for today's cases, um, in the ISU, the tension was between the governing decision to forbid betting, uh, in ISU authorized events and the requirement not to prevent the organization of external events. Um, I say this because the company that was um, effectively not authorized to, um, to, have a, to have a speed skating event uh, wanted to allow betting in it. In the European Super League, there is a tension between the objective of safeguarding the pyramid structure um, under which smaller leagues and teams actually survive as a result of the solidarity payments that are made der deriving from the bigger competitions and the requirement not to prevent the organization of leagues that compete with UEFA and FIFA. Um, and in Royal Antwerp, the tension between engaging the training and recruitment of young local players and allowing clubs to freely compete with each other by recruiting talented players wherever they're from. Um, I said that it's a perceived tension because the court and competition law is not saying that sports governing bodies can't have these safeguarding rules. All they're saying is that there's a high bar to justify them when these rules actually foreclose competition. Um, so there is a need for a clear framework. We're going back to, I think, the word of the seminar being governance. Um, a clear framework for the application of these rules based on transparent, objective, non-discriminatory and proportionate criteria. And of course, that's easier said than done. Um, but that, that is the test that must be met. And it is the onus placed on any entity that forecloses competition. Having said that, the court did acknowledge that there are some rules adopted by sports governing bodies that are solely made for the interest of sport and that have no economic element whatsoever and therefore competition law not applicable. So examples of those were the exclusion of foreign players from national teams and a uh, determination of ranking criteria used for athlete selection. This was uh, in today's ISU case. So one thing that could be considered is whether we need a greater separation between governance functions and commercial functions. And while the court did not require it, is it something that would make sports uh, governing bodies job easier going forward? But ultimately, um, if sports governance executives didn't know what competition law was before, then they certainly do or should do now because they will be reflected in their everyday job going forward, at least in the next few days, but certainly um, in, in the next few years. So moving on to the implications of the case to the sporting world, not just football um, and ice skating, but generally. So for sports governing bodies, this means first and foremost, specifically revisiting their rules on authorization of events, and in particular, the criteria that they used uh, to decide whether to authorize an event or not. It means uh, revisiting the rules on sanctions that can be put in place for players or clubs that participate in unsanctioned events. And I mean, revisiting the rules on arbitration provisions and CAS exclusivity, exclusive jurisdiction. 
Um, but also more widely, it would be prudent to undergo a more general governance review now with competition law and free movement in mind specifically. For private businesses, it means more opportunity to organize sporting events. For athletes and clubs, it gives more freedom to participate in events. It also gives an additional level of confidence to challenge uh, rules that they see as restrictive. Um, and depending on what the Belgian courts say on homegrown rules, it might also lead to significant changes to academy programs, development and management of squats and domestic and global transfer markets. And then also for competition authorities. So the case provides some very valuable guidance to all of us as practitioners, to all sports governing bodies in terms of what they need to do, but equally also some valuable guidance to what competition authorities should be looking for um, in terms of determining whether a sport governing body is, compli is compliant or not. So we might see more enforcement action in the coming years, which again goes to my point that it's prudent for sports governing bodies to undergo a governance review now. So in conclusion, I think there's going to be some very interesting developments and changes in the sport world as a result of these cases, mainly because it just put, it just highlighted the sporting world and the application of competition law to it. Um, and it's not just football and skating, it is all sports. Wonderful, thank, thank you very much for that. Um, wow, that I've just got, I've written down a, a host of questions, but um, first of all, thank you to our speakers and thank you for those people who have been writing in the chat. We really appreciate introducing yourself to others, um, but also giving your thanks. Um, I have to say again, just before we come into the Q&A, thank you to the speakers. Thank you to Borgia, Vanya, Richard and Sport and EU and uh, of the association. Sorry, I always, get, I always say Sport and EU for short. That's abbreviated version. And the Astor Institute for collaborating on this. Um, it's such an important issue. We all wanted to get together to do this free webinar to help people. And I think even just listening to your comments just now, and these are initial comments, I'm so impressed with everyone on how quickly you've gone through this to give your expert view. There's so many practical aspects of this that we can take away, but I'm going to come to the questions now. And for want of a better way, I'm just going to go to them in order. So anyone, speakers, to put your mic on and we'll deal with the aftermath. I'll put everyone into the gallery view um so everyone can see that um we've got a, a question from i have to put my glasses on I do apologize um a question from gareth four even if the esl never happens what does today's ruling mean for the evolution of domestic leagues in and into cross-border ones such as b bn liga or the old forum joining the english premier league given sephrin has already expressed the uefa's openness to transnational leagues would the pre-authorization and collaboration with UEFA be key? Who would like to take that? Anyone? Well, the quick word, good luck using EU law to get Scottish clubs into the English league. <laughs> More generally, I mean, there certainly are some interesting questions about uh, restructuring of leagues uh, on a pan-national basis. Uh, as, as things stand, UEFA um, insists on... on on the limitation of clubs to operating within the jurisdiction of the national association to which they belong, so no cross-border leagues. Um, I think that's probably compatible with European Union law because the nationality based criterion is existential to, to the structure of, of football in Europe. But I would suspect that the, the politics of it might change. I suspect UEFA might sooner rather than later be favorable to the creation of, of pan-national leagues simply to create stronger and more attractive leagues um you know outside the big five leagues national leagues are simply not attractive they're falling far behind so make them bigger if, if the scots were to join join with the nordic countries belgium netherlands you could have a very interesting league the same you could imagine in central and eastern europe but but that's that i think is more likely to come through um political and commercial incentives rather than any specific specific legal impetus thank you does anyone else have anything to add on that or i'll move on to the next question I'll take the silence as a as a no. Uh, I right, can Mark. I can can, oh. can I just add something? I oh. think Steve is right that probably under EU law will be acceptable to restrict the creation of certain transnational leagues if they will put into question the existing national leagues. So preserving national leagues may itself be an objective recognized 
um, by 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 EU law. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the, if if those transnational leagues will be structured in a way that will not uh, put into question the existence of national leagues, I think it will be hard uh, for them to be prohibited. So let's assume, for example, that instead of replacing national league or putting the question how national leagues uh, are organized in the conditions for the they will put the many other uh, at the national level you have many other competitions that complement the calendar of clubs if they will be used to replace these other competitions i think that that and the clubs will decide well i prefer instead of uh, of a league cup in addition to my national league i want to participate in a regional transnational league I think probably the national leagues and the UEFA will not be in a position if this international league will be open, for example, uh, will not be in a position to prohibit the creation of this set uh, uh, of the setting up of, the, of such a uh, regional transnational league. Thank you. We have a question from Mark O'Neill. Does the panel agree that the practical effect of this ruling will be for the elite level clubs who feel more emboldened? To set up a Super League style tournament. Well, I know that you you cover this, and I think the answer was no. But Benoit, you look like you might. <laughs> yeah, of course. Sorry, I I realised I was very rude at the beginning. I didn't introduce myself. Benoit Keen, an EU lawyer who had the honour to represent UEFA, but I am speaking in a personal capacity today. But nonetheless, uh, um, it, it just so do I think it allows emboldens clubs? Um, no. I don't think it would embolden the clubs. I think, as I said, the the court has made some very, very... Look, I, I agree with uh, Miguel and, and uh, the other speakers. Clearly, good governance is, uh, is um, to be a part of sports governance. Nobody is denying that. Uh, and as I said, I, I, I think a bit of the unfortunate... Um, the court can only address a case as it appears to it. And this case was sent before... Uh, by the Spanish courts before UEFA was even admitted to the case. This is rather extraordinary. So it didn't have the necessary background to understand that actually um, some of the people in the room who were organising the Super League, which, by the way, was done in complete secrecy, as we know, uh, with no consultation, no uh, advance notice whatsoever, and that they suddenly announced that they had a problem with authorization rules. Well, you know, UEFA is, a, like any well organized administration takes time to develop serious sets of rules. It goes back over its existing rule structures, it looks at its past experiences and procedures, and then it adopts and reforms rules. As we know, with uh, we've seen that with the financial sustainability regulations and with others. And of course, we were in the middle of a pandemic. But all that to say is that, to, to answer the question specifically, I, I think it's absolutely telling that the court has has recognized sporting merit as a legitimate consideration. And that wasn't really a discussion that arose in the ISU case. Uh, and you won't really see a, a discussion in the ISU decision about the nature of competitions that may or may not be authorized. It, it just, it, 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 because of ISU is about one or two events that this, uh, that, that this proposed organizer wanted to hold, the commission didn't necessarily go into the bigger picture issues. Um, uh, and the ISU regulations that were adopted afterwards, uh, you know, uh, I think have set out certain parameters, but maybe didn't have it for, foremost in their mind in the same way that we do in football, where, as the court has recognised, the meritocratic nature of football is absolutely essential to how it operates. And for me, that is key. So this principle of sporting merit is now absolutely enshrined in the current 2022 authorization rules if anyone speaking of transparency anyone today watching this can download them immediately they've been on your waiter's website for uh since they were adopted in 2022 and they set out very clearly the criteria that uh, is required for international club competitions to meet and the standards that they should meet and uh and the rest of it um so Okay, maybe I'll be, uh, you never say never, but I don't think anyone could read today's judgment and say that it allows, as Steve, I would agree completely with Stephen, uh, I don't think there's any indication in this judgment that a closed league could go ahead tomorrow. So we go to, I think Miguel was first, then Anton. Um, we, um, just, just, my answer. That, just to just for the fairness of every speaker, and I, I do apologise just because as well for the attendees with all the questions. Um, Please don't take offence if I ask you to summarise um, uh, as succinctly as possible, just so we can get through. So thank you, Miguel. So, first, the question was, 
will this embolden or incentivize big clubs to go ahead with uh, their own league, elitist L- L- league? My fir- uh, two parts of that of the of the answering to that. First, it will depend on UEFA. As Steve said, there is a set of preconditions that UEFA needs to to fit, uh, to comply with, in order to exercise the power to license, to authorize, or not to do this. Uh, and so, if if UEFA doesn't appropriately, and I don't think the current set of rules comply with that. So if I was a big club, I would go immediately in, and they wanted to do that. They could go now because the chance that UEFA will fail and therefore they will be authorized, they will have to be uh, uh, authorized, will, 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 could, 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 could exist. So the, the best way of preventing that is for UEFA to have the preconditions to, to do because if they have, if they fit their, those preconditions, then they pro- can prohibit it yeah. because it's a closed league, an elitist league, not based on, on, on merit. That's the first thing. The other thing, I think, will happen is that probably there is an element there that it might incentivize other companies other to try to come up with alternative leagues to the Champions League that from that may be a market that's going to be created. They can go okay. ahead and try to but they, they, that, that that's not a closed league. Wonderful. We're gonna to go to Anton first and then what I think you look like you were saying something to your mood, but let's go to Anton first. Hmm. Yes. On this point I think it's important to remind ourselves that the reason why the Super League failed is not because of UEFA and FIFA's threats. Uh, it failed because fans came out. Uh, we, we had no Super League. F- FIFA and UEFA had very little uh, responsibility, at least insofar as I interpret the factual situation in the demise of the Super League. The Super League could have gone ahead already since a long time. Uh, It could, the clubs could have said, okay, we just cut off and they can do so tomorrow. What stopped them to do that was the strong opposition of politicians driven by fans. If that opposition is still actual, and I think this judgment should also indicate that the court recognizes the importance of one key element, the open competition dimension that was at the challenge fundamentally by the Super League. If that is still the core of European football, then this judgment will not facilitate much the emergence of a Super League. If we, let's say, as football fans are still really refusing a model a la NBA, then that's also uh, not likely to happen. Uh, So this is also beyond the legal dimension of of the judgment. Then, however, it does indeed potentially embolden a uh, a new project that could try again to bypass that willingness of fans and then FIFA and UEFA will, will be in a weaker position to try to block it, even though I'm not that sure that it will be in that much of a weaker position, because again, if certain rules and procedures at, are put in place, and in particular, if certain safeguards are included, then I think they could still exercise some uh, sanctioning power that could have uh, the consequence of disincentivizing clubs and players to uh, engage in such a separate competition. So, Ben Mar, did you want to say something in Victoria? No, because Victoria, Victoria. Um, keeping it brief, just to add, this isn't the first um like alternative league idea, if you like. So, we already we currently have the ISL swim league over in America that is functioning so in terms of does it incentivize or does it embolden I mean who wouldn't want additional commercial you know income if that is permissible the question will just be do you have the right idea do you have the right audience and do you fit the do you fit the criteria that the different sporting organization will put in place thank you Bemar did you have something you wanted to add or Sorry, yeah, I, I was just going to uh, pick up on the the point there. I, I 
I mean, I agree completely that the opposition of the fans and, and the rest of it is absolutely critical. The other interesting thing is that the media rights part of this decision, um, which I didn't really address, but I think it, it confirms a lot of what we already knew from the 2003 UEFA Champions League decision, saying that joint selling can be permitted so long as there's clear efficiencies and benefits to the consumer. Um, so in that respect, I think it is interesting. But it is also interesting that I pointed out that, well, the redistribution element should be absolutely clear. Now, I, I have no difficulty. I can show you that you can see on UEFA's website, this famous chart. It uh, sets out exactly how it spends all, uh, how all the money is spent and where it goes to in the clubs, member associations and all the good causes that UEFA funds through the revenues it gets. So UEFA is very transparent about how it generates and redistributes its revenues. I'm not sure the Super League proposal which was a closed organization where the revenues were going to be held entirely amongst a select group of uh, of clubs would meet the standards that the court has so, now set. So I think, so ironically, so. that part of the decision, I think that might hurt a proposal of that nature in the future far more than anything that, that an organization like UEFA and FIFA does. Um, so I, I, I found that really interesting, but it's, it's early days. I think we all need to reread it a bit more, but <laughs> certainly I, I think it, you know, for me. It doesn't, it certainly doesn't mean though, and I think this is the key point that everyone's pointed out today. It doesn't mean you can have some sort of like new startup enterprise that hasn't really thought things through, that it hasn't got all the criteria that you said or the transparency, the redistribution, all these different things. And all of a sudden everyone's going to jump on board because it looks exciting yeah. or interesting, right? There's, it, there's a much higher threshold. It, exactly. And in fact, in the ISU case, um, one of the outcomes was in the when the ISU rewrote its rules, it included very clearly that any competition it authorised had to contribute to the solidarity of the sport as a whole um, and set that up to 10% of revenues, if I recall and, correctly. And, and, and that, before that, I come that, to... that can definitely be included in authorization rules as well, that you, you have to have a solidarity mechanism you cannot just expect to cream off the best and put nothing back in and so um, we've got a couple of questions really about and i'm trying to summarize summarize we've got Oluwatsin, um akinyemi and um tracy holmes who are basically asking a similar question and i'm sure there might be others when it goes back to the domestic court so in the super league case when it goes back to the spanish court if they were to take a decision either in favour of Super League or not in favour of Super League, what effect does that have on the rest of the European model, if any? So can you can anyone give some insights into that to say contextually what happens, or I guess in the in the Antwerp case again, what impact does that happen? What happens when, when a domestic court makes a decision? Does it bounce back again potentially? Or what 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 goes on? Who wants to take that? I know it's a complex answer, but just I'm a, just happy a bullet to start and people can yeah, think um, so it goes back to the national courts and the national courts have jurisdiction over, you know, their country, or over their jurisdiction, if you like. And um, from there, other countries will probably look at it as as something of interest, a potential guidance, but it is not enforceable in any other jurisdictions. Um, so a good example, even even the today's cases, they are not enforceable in the UK. So what does the UK do about that? Well, potentially, and this is where competition authorities come in, potentially the competition, the UK Competition Authority will want to take up a case, an example case of that nature to, to effectively set out the same rules in its way. But no, it is not directly enforceable, but likely a good guidance. And also, they're just in the background of competition law. There's been a lot of tension, isn't there, between uh, the, the UK regulator and and uh, European Commission on this? And I think that was wasn't that in the Epic case? Well, as far as I know, it was. But but so indeed, I was just going to add actually, and we do see divergence in the sport world and competition law in the sport world with Rule Forty of the Olympic Charter, which is um, which is implemented one way in Germany, Australia, etc., in a completely different way in the UK, US. So um, yes, there will there, there will be dis distinctions. Thank you very much, Rissa, and then Stephen. Yeah, it's um, basically the the mechanism of harmonization of rules, um, which is present in this field, where the national court or national um, competition authority or even national federation Olympic committee rendering a decision in compliance with the some court. 
Uh, and uh, after that, there is a certain interaction with the either international, uh, um, either uh, international federation or um, international uh, or confederation, so that the let's say UEFA or, or FIFA are more than interested to harmonize all the rules, so that all its members benefit or suffer from the same. Um, from the same set of rules and yeah like uh, victoria said um, a couple of years ago that happened with the rule 40 and with the german uh, competition authority which uh, um, represented an example to follow first for the uh, national olympic committees way beyond um, european union and uh, then uh, the uh, ioc was uh, um, maybe even push to uh, change uh, the Rule 40 in its Olympic char Charter. Thank you. Stephen? Yeah, this is this is quite unusual in the sense that um, most preliminary rulings by the Court of Justice are obviously important for the points of European law that they establish. But we usually don't care what happens back at national level. Uh, usually we don't even know what happens back at national level because it's just the national court applying the Court of Justice's ruling to the particularities of the national dispute that gave rise to the preliminary reference in the first place. Now, this is completely different. I mean, this isn't particular to Spain. It just happens to be a Spanish court that's made the reference. But the issues that arise are of relevance throughout the whole European Union and far beyond. Um, so if, if whatever the Spanish court does uh, clearly doesn't bind courts elsewhere, as Victoria has accurately told us, um, but it's going to be extremely awkward if we have a situation where the Spanish court responds to the Court of Justice's ruling in one way and an English court, not an English court, a Belgian court re reacts in a different way and so on. You get the fragmentation that, that uh, Rusa has mentioned there, and that might prompt the dynamic uh, for... Uh, legislation to be adopted because we have got in this ruling the uh, the opportunity for a dismal fragmentation in the application of football law across the, the European Union and beyond. Thank you. Benoit? Yeah, I, I was going to say clearly we, we are going to go back to the Spanish court. There are a number of issues the court has um, sent back for its decision and I think it would be premature today to, to work out exactly um, all, all the full implications of that. But I think I would just note that, you know, um, to my understanding, the, the Super League, for example, to, which is obviously the originator of this case, has never and had never made a formal application to UEFA. So I think um, any future project would obviously be the subject of the current authorization rules, which are in place, as in those in, adopted in 2022, um, and would be subject to obviously a non-discriminatory and I think it cannot be emphasized enough this will be a non any project put forward whether that's from that organization or from any other will be conducted and reviewed in a non-discriminatory manner um you know I, I know there's maybe in the the immediate aftermath of of uh of the judgment um I, I, you know there's been some uh, press releases from 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 a22 and other organizations yeah. But I mean, the reality is, if if they do want a new uh, competition uh, to be authorised, then the rules are absolutely crystal clear how they go about it and how how that will be done. So then what? Just for speed, then. So I think I've got that right. So they have to they have to apply, and then it will be judged on, yeah. the, on the criteria. Miguel, just so just for our attendees' benefit, um, we've already clarified this with speakers that they could, ha if we suspected there might be a lot of questions, they can stay on for a little bit longer. For attendees, if you want your questions answers, we'll try to go through them as quickly as possible, but we might not get to all of them. If we don't, uh, we'll copy and paste them down and we'll try to do either a, um, you know, a, a summary answer of each point for everyone. Um, but just forgive us for time. There's going to be more detailed analysis from all parties involved on this webinar and I'm sure many others in the sector over the uh, over the coming months. But Miguel, you had something you wanted to contribute. So I wonder, is a follow up on what Benoit was saying. How do we make sure that indeed any new project is going to be assessed in a non-discriminatory manner. And uh, uh, it's not enough for UEFA to say, yes, we're going to assess it in a non-discriminatory manner. But and I think- Decisions are subject to review as well. Sorry? Decisions are subject to re review. Yes, yes. Independent, independent, what, what, review. independent yes. review. So what, what I was going to say is that 
the court makes clear there's a link between procedure and substantive rules. And so one first question, and in my view, will need to be discussed in the future is, what kind of governance structure does the UEFA or any other sports organization has to set up in order to guarantee that we can trust that indeed they are going to rule in a non-discriminatory manner. And if that doesn't require some sort of separation of at, at least of separation of regulatory and commercial functions within the organization, how can the same body that has an interest in the commercial success of the its own uh, uh, competition uh, uh, at the same time be deciding on competing com com competitions? Shouldn't be has to be an independent body within OFA that decides on that aspect of regulation, for example. That's one of the questions. And second is, what does it mean independent review? Uh, 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 what will the independent review of these decisions? What, so there is a lot of aspects to be uh, uh, developed in that. One additional point that I wanted to stress, it's not very common for the Court of Justice to be this detailed on the answer it gives to national courts almost basically leaving very little margin of discretion to find that at least as the rules and procedures of UEFA were at the time that they were not complying with what the court required. It's not very, and not many people were expecting the court to do that. And by the way, the press release is normally approved by the judges. And I won't say anything more than that. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you, Richard. You got your hand up. Um, and then I'm going to have to go through. I really apologize, but hate to be rude, but I'm going to have to go through rapid fire questions. Otherwise, uh, we'll be here till tomorrow. And um, there is Christmas on the horizon. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Sean. Just a really quick uh, follow up on uh, a point that Ben made. Um, so in terms of the June 2022 authorization rules that UEFA have uh, adopted, if the Super League company were to come back with an application, um, would they be disbarred given that they have been involved in a in a in in developing the Super League in the previous five years, because that's one of the technical criteria. There's there's a non, it's a, got a non-retroactive effect uh, part to that rule. So they, but, the rules only apply from the moment that they were adopted in 2022. So it wouldn't relate to anything that happened previously in 2021. But, but they've still been involved in yeah, but it, it, since but 2022. The five, the five years starts from the, from whatever date in June, 2022, um uh that 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 we're talking about it, it would require um a separate uh investigation into anything so let's say I, i'm not I, I think it's easier maybe speak outside of super league and, and the rest of it uh, just imagine hypothetically um a number of clubs participating in an unauthorized event um without having received the relevant permission and they did that let's say in 2023 uh, next year, 2024, um, then they come back in 2028 and say, actually, we want to set up something. I think in that, those circumstances, the UEFA would look back and say, well, actually, you breached the rules five years. Within the five years, uh, you need you need a bit more time before you come back to us. So that, 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 but just to be absolutely clear to anyone reading those rules, they have specifically said that there is no retroactive effect before their adoption in 2022. Thank you. Um, so we have a question from Ruben Elkbalt. Oh, sorry, I've said that wrong. Um, he, they were surprised about the ancillary restraint doctrine um, reference. They're saying paragraph 185, that this does not apply to the object restriction. They say that this seems to differentiate from older case law, such as Remeya and Metro. Um, they were keen to get your thoughts on that. So, Stephen? Yeah, it's maybe a bit of a technical legal point, so I don't think we should dwell on it, but it's a really good question. It, it seems clear that on this point, the court is changing it, it, its previous approach. Uh, we've always understood that the ancillary restraints doctrine uh, applies to uh, exclude a practice from the scope of Article 101, Paragraph 1, uh, and where it applies, there is no need to go on to consider whether the restriction is by object or by effect. What the court seems to have done today is to say that actually the ancillary restraints doctrine does not apply to particular um, hardcore restrictions, you might call them object restrictions, um, 
so, so that the examination of whether something is a restriction by object precedes the ancillary restraints doctrine rather than comes after it. That seems to be entirely new. I don't know why the court's done that. I suspect it's because some members of the court are extremely nervous about the Maker Medina doctrine having um, too broad a scope of application. Uh, so I think that what the court has done today is to is to send the message that the Maker Medina doctrine, the Vauters doctrine, applies only exceptionally. Thank you. Anton. But it still still leaves so, open one oh one three. Um yeah, so sure, but that's narrower. I must, I must admit, I haven't had the chance to give it, you know, we're in the immediate aftermath. I haven't given full thought to it either. But I, I, I do wonder whether if, if something inherently dangerous, for example, was proposed in a motorsport for, a, for, for sake of argument, whether that would justify a one one three measure, even if the authorization rules didn't didn't come under one one one. Thanks. Thanks, Benoit. That would Thanks be my inclination. I wouldn't say, I, I think... I don't. I would be surprised if the court is saying that there's no way to step in in an emergency, so to speak. But I, I agree the, that this is something we all have to think a bit more in detail. Yes, I I, I would think, and to put that in perspective, to put also what Stephen mentioned from a more general EU law perspective, but applied to the sporting context in particular, this means that in these cases where a restriction is qualified as object. Uh, which seems to be very much focused on these gate gatekeeper cases, I assume, Super League. Um, the justification part, which until now was very much a proportionality analysis a la free movement, is moved to 101.3 and to an argumentation that shifts in nature and become much more economical. So we will have, and this is for the sports governing bodies, also a, a problem of costs, actually. They will have to start quantifying the efficiencies that they are claiming, potentially through different types of arguments in the mobilization of different experts, which might cost them more in terms of defending their rules. So this is not an anodyne shift. It's a bit of a surprising one, I think, for uh, observers. And uh, we need to take full account of, of uh, what it will imply, both in the sporting context and beyond the sporting context for, for private regulators that are subjected to EU competition. So th thank you very much for that. So I've gone through the questions. And as I said, we're just running short with time. In summary, it seems um, Two of the, the major questions are around the media rights and distribution of that and the exclusivity around that. Um, Andrea Bozzo um, put in there that, um, you know, do you think this is a game changing moment right, about having the exclusivity to commercialize um, media rights? What's, I wonder if we could just get people's views on that. And then the second question um, would be about what does this mean for the likes of um, Six Nations and other sports organized governing bodies and, and leagues? At the moment, more broadly, I think Victoria you did a great job of summarising some of the practical aspects of it. But I wonder if there was any final thoughts on those two points. The first one, media rights, and the impact of 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 the of the exclusivity um, of the rights of the organiser to exploit that. As I say, it, it it confirms what we, in a sense, we knew from two thousand and three commission decision on in UEFA that that if you are going to go through joint selling, you you need to demonstrate the efficiencies and the benefits. Um, it makes that absolutely crystal clear, uh, and and to me that um, that actually puts the challenge on any potential project out there that that wouldn't put in place a fair and transparent redistribution system amongst all its participants. So I think it's um I th for me, you know, subject to a closer read, it, it seems to be a positive reinstatement of some of the principles we we saw in two thousand three decision. Um, Thank you. Thank you, Borja. Yeah, hi, hello. Uh, yes, well, I wanted to comment on that because it's actually the part of the judgment that must listen brought more got more my attention. Uh, I do agree with Ben in that it does seem to 
to reinforce the commission's uh, the commission's argument. But, but in my, uh, I mean, of course, there are two two issues there. First, of course, that uh, only applies to as the courses uh, competitions under FIFA and UEFA jurisdiction. So, so initially, I was a little bit worried whether this could apply, for example, to collective selling of the British, well, not the British Premier League, of course, not anymore, but <laughs> the um, the Spanish league or any other league, but uh, not in this in this judgment, uh, of course. So, um, but the other. Uh, I found that, although I could agree with Ben, I think the court, in the way it expressed that, it was a little bit more hesitant. I mean, it said that can be done, but it really, I mean, it's not, uh, so, uh, it's a sort of a debate that seemed to be clear cut for all of us, that the court now says, well, it needs really to be very, very well, very well analyzed and with uh, counting and with sufficient uh, and, um, uh, and and with sufficient uh, data and 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 all, and all of that so it uh, indeed it does put the, now the burden of the proof on the, on whoever wants to to do collective uh, collective selling although i have to say that then it also read as is the court who are having second thoughts because then in another in another uh, in another paragraph was telling the, the Madrid court, okay, but take this into account and take this other thing into account and take this other third thing into account when, when deciding on that. So it, uh, I have to say, I found that part of the judgment a little bit uh, odd on the, from the court. Thank you. Miguel? I, I just wanted to note that the emphasis placed on redistribution, it's new uh, with respect to 2003. So there's something relevant there that the court is stating. And that we'll have to see what the commission makes use of that. The commission has not really monitored the extent to which the UEFA rules of the distribution comply with the purpose of solidarity and promoting equal conditions of competition. Will we start to do that in light of what the court is saying? Or whether, uh, the, for example, there's a new association of European clubs. I don't know the exact name that they have now. I'll just be not Someone asked a question one. about it. U -E yeah. UEC. UEC, uh, uh, whether, for example, they will come with a complaint to the Commission and if the Commission declines it because they think that the money is not being well redistributed and if the Commission uh, declines to act and if they appeal to the court, what will happen and what how the court assess that. So there's a potential there for something new. Certainly, I think that the, the, the court opens the door to a much higher level of scrutiny of how the money of the Champions League and the European competitions is being redistributed among clubs. So there was some excellent questions around the role of the ECA, which I also thought was, was, was really interesting on that point about recognised bodies. One of the questions that, um, and I guess we should just wrap up, but one of the questions that, that you've left me thinking about, and maybe no, there's no answer required, but something we can pick up in a further discussion um, in the new year, which is you mentioned, obviously, um, uh, the shift away from um, Article 165, one thing I've observed over the years is, is and obviously um, uh, I think half of the group on here have been doing research on sports diplomacy and, and law um, in the European Union, is that for, from a law and sport perspective, from my perspective, we've always said the sports market hasn't been a, a market that's really evolved that much. It's still in its infancy and from an economic perspective. It's, it's really, in terms of its governance structures, they does so lots of really lots of little things very well or, or some big things very well produce the product but some of the other infrastructure around it hasn't been as they say as up to speed as, as pharmaceuticals or the finance sector and so forth as we've seen with the analysis of the independent regulator it seemed to me that there was a, a reliance on governing bodies in particular uefa and fifa to rely on 165 and this whole european sports values and models as the as the raison d'etre for its it, very existence a bit like the irc with the um uh, with its its own uh, values around why the IOC and the Olympic values and how that gives it um, authority to uh, make decisions and govern sport. Um, is this just the case then, or I guess from you, what I'm left wondering is, is this the case that sport now, whilst it's got some unique attributions, as you said, throughout, I think many of you have said that, you know, sport really needs to recognise that it is this economic activity, that it is a business. And therefore, when it is operating as a business, it needs to be and have the, I think you've also had the governance structures in place, these these transparent procedures in place. That seems like a, a quite a, I think for a lot of sports organisations, it's going to be quite a big shift over the, the coming years. And does that mean that there's going to be greater scrutiny from competition authorities on a domestic level to, to scrutinise? Is there going to be more appetite now? Like we saw in the tax cases, is going to be more appetite, do you think, for competition authorities to take independent action looking into the governance of sport domestically? That was a long question, sorry. <laughs>
Get, Any views on Sean, that? Can, Sean, can I just can I just say something about one six five? In that uh, it's a rather flippant point, but I mean it's put, it's been put back in its box a little bit, I think, um, which some would find a bit of a, a bit of a shame, and even to the extent which um, uh, the scholars in the audience who have been writing on EU sports law and policy might need to change their uh, focus and call it EU sports law and actions because the court did not like the term policy. So uh, it's, a, it's a, a change of language, so to speak. Thank you. Victoria? Mm -hmm. I think um, in terms of will there be more enforcement, I think we have seen more enforcement over the years. Having said that, and there's more, I think personally, there's more to come. Um, having said that, competition authorities do have, um, you know, they have they don't have as many as much resource as they would like to obviously but also they have a prioritization mechanism and for the uk for now support is not on it for example that doesn't mean that it won't be next year um but probably for this year if there is more enforcement it will be something fairly new i haven't gone through the um through the importance of where sport places for all competition authorities in europe um, but I don't know that anyone is or what has said that they will look into it right away. Mm. Thank you. Oh, sorry, uh, Rissa. And just to complete it, uh, in my opinion, it also depends primarily on how the like sports governing bodies will handle their part of mm -hmm. the job in uh, putting on paper the um the recommendations or the uh, the the the, the uh, will of the court um in today's judgments it will i think there is a direct causal link between this and the quality of this job and the amount of uh, cases on the national level that will follow Benoit, and then we'll come to richard and borja yeah. to give the closing remarks I, I just want to pick up i mean i think it comes down to sports governing bodies being good at what they do. You, you should have good administrative processes in place. You should adopt your rules in a transparent manner and um, and, and ensure that they're enforced fairly. And, and I think uh, the judgment maybe uh, reiterates those points. And when you do those, then you are entitled to defend your values. And coming down to in terms of revenues and the rest, yes, I, I've never understood why sports federations don't say enough about how they spend their money, because most of them spend all of it almost primarily on helping uh, the, the the grassroots. I, I, I've been saying this for years. Publish an annual report. Show us what you do. It's only going to benefit you. So if there's one leg away from all of this, sports federations tell people what good you are doing and then they will understand it so i think that's that can only be a good part a positive development out of this uh, i agree uh, anton can, can i have just a word because i said i would do it at the beginning i mean we yeah. didn't mention cas and i still think this is a yeah. really important part yeah. of the icu judgment and that is very specific to icu and i do think that what is in there is basically uh an argument for any claimant to just go after a decision of a sports governing bodies without going to CAS, by bypassing CAS. As from now on, you can challenge any decision, regulation that is issued by an international sports governing body in front of a national court without fearing the bindingness of the gas arbitration, as long as you are invoking arguments that are grounded in EU law and in particular EU competition or, or EU free movement. And this is, I think, maybe it's going to be mostly overseen, but it is an important message in uh, this range of three judgment that we have. Okay, I'll take it back. It looks like it wasn't going to be the last word because yeah. we've got two hands up. But okay, we really do have to wrap up in a second though. So Benoit, if you can be be quick and, I, and I, growl. I, I hate to disagree with Antoine, but he knows I've disagreed with him on this point for many years. And um, uh, I, I don't think it does. First of all, the uh, it was rather unique that the, the commission found that there was an, it reinforced the restriction. So first of all, you have to show that whatever you were challenging somehow breached competition law, and then it was unfair that you were made to go to CAS on it. And secondly, the concern of the commission was is that there was uh, no way to essentially um, directly then uh, challenge the award that CAS might make on these uh, on these Article 101 and 102 issues. 
The way the ISU addressed that, having discussed it intensely with the European Commission after the decision in 2017, was to uh, tighten up its rules where it just made it absolutely clear that the award of a CAS decision could be challenged, could be appealed before the Swiss Federal Tribunal, or alternatively could be challenged on grounds of public policy in accordance with national procedural rules. And that satisfied the European Commission. So it may be a lot of federations need to tweak the rules, make sure that they're just uh, absolutely clear. But I think in the end, this this I, I'm not saying I'm not understating the importance of what the court has said today. I, I highly respect it, but I think that the fix is is maybe easier than the maybe look first looks at after today's judgment. Thanks, Ben. Miguel, I'm I'm somewhere between uh, Antoine and Benoit. <laughs> um, I'm curious of how that will come to be in, interpreted because there's an element there that somehow. The, the way the case is presented, the Swiss Supreme Court, in particular with EU competition law, doesn't take that in the re, into account in the review, if I understood it correctly, of, 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 of the, the awards. So the question is whether the, that problem could be remedied by the Swiss Supreme Court um, taking more seriously EU law, whether, whether that could be enough or, or, or not. On the other hand, there seems to be a clear mandate to that and a, require, a requirement of that, and that it, it may embolden further reforms of the Court of Arbitration for Sports. Uh, and I think that certainly this is bound to be able to destabilize the, the, the international sport arbitration system, and that the best way for CAS and the sports federations will be to reform CAS appropriately. To. It will be probably the best defense that they have and the best way to then uh, in future cases, have a more friendly approach from the Court of Justice that certainly seems not to have been the case. In that respect, I agree with Antoine. Thank you. Borja and Richard, would you like to give the final words? Uh, I'll leave yeah, it to Borja. <laughs> okay. I was going to leave it to you, Richard. So, uh, <laughs> in any case, yeah, that's, uh, thanks, uh, Sean. Uh, well, first of all, thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, to Sean for uh, providing the for chairing this uh, exceptional exceptional event and uh, to all the panelists for giving up for giving up their their time at such a short notice and really enlightening us i think it's been a really wonderful and also thanks to all the people attending and i think it was really great that we all had uh, really at yes yes we really didn't have to discuss a lot we were at first side we all wanted to cooperate so thank you to Antoine at the, at the Acer institute thank you to law in the sport thank you to Glo um, catholica global school of law for really joining forces in which i really think it probably could uh, it probably could be ruled by the, the the Court of Justice as an abuse of dominant possession in the knowledge of uh, EU sports law. But nevertheless, I think we have a legitimate objective, which is that of discussing the, the rulings. So really, thanks to all of you for that. And I hopefully we will repeat it. And certainly we'll have more, far more discussions in our uh, upcoming events and seminars. If anyone doesn't know sport and EU, please go to sportandeu.com and you can join us. Um, and then as to the rulings, I think we'll keep discussing really a lot about about, uh, about that, not least because let's let's be fairly honest. Uh, behind this legal challenge, there is a very well resourced oil machinery. If you read the Super League case already, one of the first paragraph it mentions that J.P. Morgan had promised four thousand uh, million euros to bankroll the European Super League company SL, and that's there in the case. So cannot be cannot be denying. So uh, we are certainly going on. Well, we are going to hear of that, and not least also because Florentino Perez has. If you know him, uh, you are not familiar with him, but if you know him, you know that he doesn't accept enough for an answer. So uh, I will just finish on by saying that uh, perhaps for me, the two take home messages of these cases is that uh, there were there was no mention of the European model of sport in uh, any of the rulings, uh, which uh, so I would really would like to see where Advocate General Rantos is now, unfortunately, but there was no mention at all. Although on the other hand, I seem to detect, and I've only read uh, in, in depth the, the Super League ruling, uh, a new language of the court in referring to sport. Uh, indeed, uh, the, the open competitions, uh, they referred to uh, to, to the redistribution, not only to the participating clubs, they referred to the importance. So it certainly the court uh, seems to see, to, see, to see sport in a different way, or at least to me, what it seems is that 
the European Court of Justice seems to be happy with some of the values that are normally referred as the European model of sport, but is, it is extremely unhappy though with some of the governance structures of the uh, European mo uh, model of sport, as they as they are called, I'm probably not very happy of the member states defending them. But of course, it's the it's the right of the member states to legislate in that if they so want. And finally, yes, uh, I think Richard also spotted that. I don't know whether we are any more uh, experts on EU sport policy on EU sport actions, but. <laughs> The court doesn't seem to be very happy in uh, in seeing that the European Commission and the member states are developing a European Union sport policy, which is uh, which is a pity. But uh, I think we, it's not the last we'll hear of all that. Uh, really, thank you to to you, Sean. Really, thank you to all the to the panelists uh, for that. It's it's really been a pleasure. Brilliant. Thank you for that summation. And yeah. um, everyone, I hope you have a wonderful festive period wherever you are in the world. Thank you for joining in. I think all of us were hoping this was, yeah, we hope it, you know, enjoy reading the judgments and giving your own reflections and thoughts on it. Um, thank you all very much for those who uh, asked their questions. I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of them. As I said, this will be uh, published onto our YouTube channel. We'll give it to the, the other organ, uh, to Sport in EU and to the ASA Institute as well, so they can do with them what they want as well. So do, I think the more people get access to this wonderful information, the better it is, so we can get to a, a general consensus of understanding. Um, and thank you again. As Paul said to all of our wonderful speakers, we hope you have a great festive period. And um, if you enjoyed it, please share it with people. Uh, other than that, have a great rest of your day. Thank you all. So.